Good morning, and welcome to、uh, Ridgepoint Church. We're going to start our service this morning, just getting right into worship. So I invite you to stand, and as you prepare your hearts, think about the song we're about to sing. It is a song of joy, and it talks about all these different things that God does for us, has done for us in the past, and will continue to do for us in the future with His promises. So let's sing this first song loud. And give him all the praise that we can bring this morning. Shit. 
was before there was light walked across the pages of time he who made every living thing behold him he who heard humanity's cry left his throne to wake as a child he became like the least of us behold him Jesus, Son of God, Messiah, the Lamb, the Roaring Lion, oh, be still and behold We've declared that praise is a weapon. It's a weapon that silences our enemy and calms our anxiety. We've reminded ourselves that Jesus, the Son of God, Messiah, the Lamb and the Roaring Lion, is the same Jesus who dined with sinners and saints, healed the blind, the lost, and the lame. 
When you behold Jesus, who do you see? Do you see a friend? Do you see someone who's closer to you than a brother? He is. There's no judgment, only love. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, what a friend.
Savior He is. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand, and everything around me is shaken. I've never been more glad, and I put my faith in Jesus, cause He's never let me down. He's faithful through generations So why would He fail now? He won't He won't I still got joy in chaos I've got peace that makes no sense so I won't be going under I'm not held by my own strength Cause I feel my life on Jesus And He's never let me down He's faithful in every season So I
Heavenly Father, we're just so grateful and humbled for that promise that you are a perfect God that we serve and you never fail. And when we mess up and sin is all around us, you still have the ability to use us for your glory, for your kingdom, for your perfection. We are so grateful that you choose to make us a part of your story. Be with us. Continue to pour into our hearts this hour. Be with Joe as he speaks your word through him. Help us grow closer to you. We are hungry, Lord. We want to know you more. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. As you know, we are right in the middle of our big building expansion project, and things are moving along really well. You've probably noticed the new kids and student wings being constructed outside over the past few months, and most of our old kids and student wings are reopened now with fresh paint, carpet, and other touch-ups to better serve our adult groups and classes. If you haven't been down these hallways yet, come check them out sometime. They're looking really, really great. This week, starting Monday, September 26, a new phase of construction will begin, and this is a fairly significant one that is causing us to shuffle things around quite a bit. Here are the big things that you need to know. First, starting this Wednesday, September 28th, the church office space will be under construction for several months. During this time, a few of our staff members will remain in the building, but most of us are gonna be working off-site. If you have questions or if you need to meet with a staff member, we recommend communicating primarily through email. A list of our addresses can be found right here. The office will still be open, so if you come to church during the week, please enter through the entrance currently labeled Kids and Students next to our playground. Our receptionist will be available to help on site, or you can always call the church office during office hours. Next, our nursery is the other big space affected by this phase of construction. This Wednesday, September 28th, there will be no nursery available for our Wednesday night programming, but kids pre-K through middle school will still meet in the regular rooms. Starting next Sunday, October 2nd, the nursery will be relocated to the new A hallway, down by the old amphitheater where our kids' classrooms used to be. The nursery will still be open on Sundays during our 9.30 and 11 o'clock services, plus Wednesday starting October 5th, and other events throughout the week where we typically offer nursery care. I know this is kind of a lot, but don't worry parents, you should receive detailed communication from Cynthia, Sharice, and our kids' ministry team over the coming weeks to ensure that you know where to take your kids. Starting next Sunday, October 2nd, a handful of our adult Sunday school classes are also relocating. The only ones who are moving are the ones who are currently meeting in the conference room or the office area. So if you're not sure where your class will meet next week, contact your leader or check out the construction page on our website. And speaking of that page on our website, we are doing our best to keep that page updated with the latest construction info. Sometimes schedules change or meeting locations are forced to move at the last minute, so please keep an eye on mine. This project is so exciting, and these new spaces are really going to serve us well for the decades to come. The inconvenience is worth it, so thank you again for your understanding and flexibility as we all work through these changes together. And now, speaking of all this long-term planning, let's continue our Base Camp teaching series with a message from Pastor Joe. This month we're in a sermon series called Base Camp, which is explaining some of the critical items that we need as a church for the future in order to achieve our purpose. And as we all know, if you've uh, done some hiking in your life, the base camp is the last place you go before you go on your hike up the mountain. When you go to the base camp, there's a couple things that you do. You audit all your climbing gear and all your supplies. You make a couple of choices. Choice number one is to get something that you had forgotten or something that because there's weather that's going to happen upon you that you didn't pack for, you get that so that you have that supply that's necessary. But the second thing, the other decision is to leave things behind that you know that you're not going to need so you can travel as lightly as possible. These two things are critical and actually makes for a successful hike. So during this series, our teaching team is looking at the vital items needed for Ridgepoint's next 
hike up the mountain. We're all in this base camp together, so we have the opportunity to see what's missing, but also to add something to what's missing, but also to leave things behind so that we can go on this hike together. So today we're going to talk about this vital piece called uh, this commitment to Christian growth within community. This idea is at the heart of the opening of Paul's letter to the Roman church. So if you have your Bibles, you can go to Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. Paul says this in his opening words. I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that I planned many times to come to you, but I've been prevented from doing so until now, in order that I might have a harvest among you, just as I have had among the other Gentiles. So we learn a couple of critical things here. Number one, Paul has not been to this church personally, but he certainly knows them. He's been wanting to go there. So a lot of scholars have been asking the question, what was Paul's intention of going to the Roman church? It's going to be a dangerous journey. Many have supposed that it's because he wanted to create Rome as the western epicenter for future mission into the western part of the Roman Empire. Just like Antioch was a, a base camp for one part of the world, he wanted Rome to be the next part. But at the heart of this letter, as we read it from beginning to end, what we conclude is that this was a peacemaking mission in his letter writing to this church. In the book of Romans, Paul is not a an intellectual public figure who's scripting a long and winding argument for a nameless, faceless crowd. He's actually deeply invested in this church. In fact, if you go to the very last chapter in Romans 16, there's 29 different names that Paul lists in salutations at the very end. He knows people in this church, even though he's not been there before, and he's quite aware of what's going on in their church, which begs the question, what's going on in the church? Why is he urgently writing this letter? What we can conclude is that the church in Rome was in a vulnerable state. And it's important for us to understand this if we're going to understand the book of Romans. And the reason that we have to look at it once again is because in modern Christianity, there's been a a temptation to boil down Romans into a collection of verses that when you read them together, it gives this plan of salvation, but it may not actually get to the heart of what the book is all about. Somebody called this the Romans Road in the early 1970s, and it's been quite common to look at Romans only in that lens ever since. This is what the Romans Road kind of looks like. Maybe this is familiar to you. Paul goes all the way to Romans 3.10 for the start of this road, I guess, and it says, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. Jumping ahead to a few verses to verse 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And then jumping ahead to chapter 6, verse 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. But then going back to chapter 5 on this road, it says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Then we can jump ahead to Romans 10, verses 9 through 10, which says, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. Then we scoot a couple verses forward in the middle of a sentence. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But then we go back to chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, and it says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. We look at this in all together. There's a couple of issues that challenge this idea of this being the intent and the Romans road. Number one, this doesn't resemble a helpful road because it goes backwards and forwards and then backwards and forwards again. It doesn't seem to be a line straight through the entirety of the letter. But perhaps the second thing is the most critical thing. Notice that the Romans road does nothing with chapters one and two. And it does nothing with chapters 11 through 16. It forgets the beginning and the end of this letter, which challenges whether this actually gets to the bottom of what this letter is all about. New Testament scholar Scott McKnight was so convinced of this missing element that he wrote a book called Reading Romans Backwards, which in the Skillen household we called Snamor, because that's what Romans is backwards. But anyways, he allows the average reader to get the end of Romans first. Because in Scott McKnight's 
church history as a kid, whenever it was pastor preaching a sermon series on Romans or someone leading a Bible study on the book of Romans, he said this odd thing would happen every time. By the time we got to chapter 12, we felt like God was calling us to talk about something else, but it was mainly because everybody was so exhausted that we got to chapter 12 that we never finished the book. Here's the problem with that. Romans 13 through 16, the end of the book, is actually the ministry context of the letter. It's actually the, the lived out portion of the book of Romans. So if we have no idea what happens there, if we don't really have any idea about what goes on in the book of Romans. If we look at what goes on in Romans 13 through 16, we see this issue, this vulnerable state this church is in. There, is, there needs to be unity between two angry groups of Christians in Rome. Paul calls one group the weak and he calls the other the strong. In general, the weak that Paul refers to are the Jewish Christians who are trying to hold on for dear life to keep the church their way with their Jewish customs, their way of worship, and their ethics. And the strong are the non-Jewish Christians who are seeking to find a new type of Christianity for a new world around them. What we know is that there, at the very beginning of this church, there was both Jews and non-Jews in the church. But somewhere in the 40s and 50s of the first century, Emperor Claudius kicked all the Jews out of Rome. They could no longer live in Rome, and they were refugees in a distant land. We think that for the whole 10 years that they're gone, some drastic changes began to happen in their church. Because with the Jews gone, the non-Jews took the opportunity to make the church more into the way that they would want to have it. It would be like this. Imagine with me a modern church where there is a traditional worship service and a contemporary worship service on a Sunday morning. Imagine it with me, okay? But imagine all the contemporary worshipers leave on an extended vacation, leaving the traditional worshipers behind. And while the contemporary worshipers are gone, like a new pipe organ comes in, pews all the way, stained glass everywhere, take all the speakers down. Now imagine how you'd feel in that moment. It's understandable to imagine why such a deep disagreement would happen in a church like that when this happened. Because on the one hand, the non-Jews are eager to scrub out all, any, any hint of Jewishness in their worship because they didn't want to be called on by the local authorities and be accused of being Jews in the city of Rome during this time and get kicked out of town. But at the same time, the Jewish Christians, when they returned back to their church that they loved when they were forced to leave 10 years earlier, they would have felt like they were cheated somehow, like someone had taken their church from them. So Paul had a tall task when he wrote to the Roman church. He had to mend the deep rift between them first. That had to be done first in order to prepare them for mission into the world out there around them. So Scott McKnight says, there's a different way to get to the heart of Romans in a road, a spine of what the teaching of Romans is all about. And it goes something like this. Romans chapter 1, verses 16 through 17. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel because of the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Then jumping ahead to chapter five. Therefore, since we've been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Then jumping to chapter 8, the final stanza of this great, wonderful chapter, it says, For I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Jumping ahead to a critical piece in Romans 10, 12, For there is no difference between the Jew and the Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. And the argument comes to its crescendo in chapter 15, verse 7. And if you wanted to memorize one verse and get to the heart of the book of Romans, it's this one. Paul looks at both of these groups who are fighting and are angry at one another. And he says this as his parting words. Accept one another. Then as Jesus Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. So the goal of Romans is not individual pilgrims on a faith journey, but it's a group of Christians on two sides of hurt, pain, and distrust that have been told collectively together to accept one another, even though all these painful things have happened in the past. 
At the heart of Paul's mission to roam and to everyone else, everywhere else in the world as we know it, was to create diverse communities of faith, people from every tribe and from every family under heaven. In our best estimates in the ancient world, no other leader tried to do this. And they didn't do it because it's so tough to do. But it was at the heart of the reason why Paul experienced so much resistance everywhere he went, whether it was Rome or Philippi or Thessalonica, everywhere he went, people resisted him putting these types of groups together. There was a conversation once between two Anglican bishops, and one of them said to the other, everywhere Paul went, a riot broke out. Everywhere I go, they serve tea. And it's true. Putting people together who normally don't belong together was kind of a revolutionary endeavor, and it still is. The process is always challenging because you encounter things you never thought you'd have to calculate. Progress is hard fought and incredibly slow. Deep inside, I believe that we have a hope as human beings. We want to befriend everyone around us. I believe that's true. That's the image of God within us. But I think right next to it, there's a deep fear. The fear that we're going to be rejected, that we're going to be taken advantage of, or that it's going to be a wasted effort. Surely you've heard the story of a man who was marooned on a deserted island for 20 years. And he was there trying to survive. And one day a helicopter got pushed off its flight path. And they noticed him and his efforts to try to get the word out. And so they landed there and they wanted to rescue this guy. And they noticed that as when they landed on the beach that there were three huts that he built near the sand. And so they said, hey, before we go, tell us the story of what you've built here. So he looked at the first building and he said this is my home this is where I lived and they said what about the second one and he had a lot of pride in his heart like he his back straightened up and he said that's where I went to church on Sunday and they said well, what about this third hut and he goes I don't want to talk about that I don't want to talk about it and they're like no 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 here's the deal you can't get on the helicopter to tell us the story of the third hut and he said well that's the church that I used to go to but I don't stand them. I can't stand those people any longer Let me, let me share a couple of things that are concerning that may frustrate and may alarm us. This first slide is a, a slide that Ryan Burge put together. He's a sociologist and a Baptist minister. He gave this to Pew Research after some data was put together. They did two different surveys, one in 2016 and one in 2022, about American life, particularly a political life of America. How the average Republican American thought of the average Democratic American and vice versa. So they asked them a series of questions and they gave them a scale. They said, when you think about the pers- people from the other party, are they somewhat more, a lot more, so a lot more, somewhat more, somewhat less, or a lot less likely to be closed-minded, dishonest, immoral, unintelligent, or lazy people? So they did that survey in 2016. And they did it again in the summer of 2022. And as you can tell, there's been a change from 2016 to 2022. People in different political affiliations think quite less of people who are different from them in an increasing measure in our society. So what does this mean? We could say 12 or 15 different reactions to this. But here's one to consider. If there's a good chance that you or I allow American politics to be the governing focus of our lives, not just an interest, not just something that we keep apprised of, but the governing interest and focus of who we are. We read about it, we get on YouTube down rabbit holes, it's the topic of conversation that we have with all the people in our life, whether they like it or not. There is a chance that we'll grow a deeper and we'll think less and less of the people who are not like us in our culture. And here's the deal. I hope that we can agree that there are Christians in both political parties. Therefore, if you can agree with that question or that with that statement, here's a reflective question. Why go deeper into political action if it most certainly leads to demonizing other believers? Also including the neighbors that Jesus wants us to love regardless if they're a believer or not. Here's a better question too. Why not choose a path that would yield friendship and community instead of animosity and division. Here's the second troubling thing. 
Statistics show that we're becoming more of a lonely civilization as we're becoming more divided. A recent study by Harvard Health revealed that 36% of Americans experience serious loneliness. Included in that 36% are 61% of young people ages 18 to 25, and 51% of mothers with young children. In this study, they found that about a half of young adults reported that no one in the past few weeks had taken more than a few minutes to ask how they were doing in a way that made them feel like that person genuinely cared. So this is the part of the service where you take out your cell phone and you text a young adult and tell them that you're thinking about them and that you'd like to catch up later this afternoon. In light of these things and more, we need to hear Paul's admonition in our day once again. We need to receive and accept one another. Going back to Romans 1, Paul says this happens when we dwell together in micro-communities where there's an assumption that we're going to encourage one another. He says once again in verse 12 that we be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. A vital part of church work is to put people together in small groups. Now we can call groups many different things in church life. That could be Sunday schools, that could be life groups, that can be Bible studies, that can also be activity groups. What we find is that when people find their way into these communities and truly, genuinely want to connect and dwell there, that, they, that the, these things are a greenhouse for Christian growth in their life. If you give your best to these groups, history shows you will grow in your faith. That's why as we're here at the base camp, that's why when we're thinking about our next hike as a, a church, that's why we're imploring everyone who calls Ridgepoint home to belong to a group. Now you don't have to belong to every group out there. You just gotta belong to one of the groups. But this belonging has to transcend just showing up in order to make people happy and to, to get off some truancy list that we have in our database or something like that. As we interact with groups, there's a delicate balance that we have to create. One part of that balance is to be counted on. And the other part of that balance is to learn to count on others. Whenever you find that balance, whenever I find that balance of counting on others and being counted on, that's when faith family happens. When we're counted on, it brings out the best in us because we know that people need us there and they need our gifts. When we count on others, we learn a great Christian truth that we need others to help us, that we can't do it alone. And it was never the intention to be that way in the first place. But I understand, I can, I can understand the response that you and I might have. I'm a busy person. How do you expect me to do all that I'm required to do and add a group life experience on top of that. I understand that you and I probably don't have time. But a question needs to be asked. If we could just rank the things that have the greatest value in our life, there's a list that all of us have, wouldn't you say that your Christian spirituality, that your vitality in the faith, growing deeper in your commitment to Jesus, has to be towards the top of the list? If it is, then we'll move things out of the way in order to make space for this in our life. I love the way that author Bob Goff talks to people who are busy. He gives them this practice called quit something every Thursday. And here's the gist of it. Every Thursday, quit something until you get your life back. I heard a pastor talk about this once, about how the stress and the strain of schedules and groups often keeps people out of community. And he says all of us are like a Lego piece. We've got like this board of space that we can add stuff to. Ideologies, habits, hobbies, our work, our families, all these things are included. And bit by bit we add things to it and it fills up like this one. This is, I've got like, I don't know, Batman and all of these characters from Ezra's Legos uh, on here. And so you think, okay, like I need to add now groups onto this thing. How am I gonna do that? And it's the delicate process of saying, maybe this thing isn't as, isn't as important. So that Batman can belong, right? right? But here's the deal. All of us don't have the same bandwidth. Some of us have the social capacity of a big piece like this. Some of us have a smaller piece like this. Some of us are married to somebody like this and we're like this. And there's constant conflict on the schedule. I just want a free night. Free night can happen after we die, you know, type of thing. <laughs> it's like, how do you manage all of that? I understand that. We all have different capacities for connection, but here's where we're all the same. All of us need to find ourselves in a group. 
And if we could do that, then our faith will flourish. I sent out an email to over 900 people in our church. asking They were connected to a group in some way, some experience in their time here. And I asked them, how have groups allowed you to be mutually encouraged in your faith? And I got so many responses back, I couldn't share all of them. But I wanted to share a bit so that you can get a window into the opportunity of group life. And so let me just share a couple of those responses that I got. Lance Guthrie, whose birthday was yesterday. Happy birthday, Lance. Uh, Faith groups help you share personal details and feelings you would not otherwise share to others and get a biblical perspective on it. Jim Lowen living his best life. Says it's a great way to start the week and be challenged by the insight of others in the group and be inspired just knowing there are others who are seeking to know God better and live out what they believe. Sue Bransford, who's covering both K-State and KU in this picture, Uh, We point each other to God no matter what life issue we're struggling with, right? Chad Lambert sent me four different emails with responses, so I had to narrow it down. This is what he said. My journey groups inspire me and help me see through their thoughts about how much God knows me, cares about me, and just how willing and able he really is to help me and love me. I see now God, God does have a perfect plan, one that is good. John Plinsky, who leads Bible studies here, he says, this Christian walk is all about relationships, first with Jesus, then with our Christian brothers and sisters. That's the beautiful thing about these groups. We share each other's burdens, we praise together. It's a family. Chantel, I loved her response. She said, my little family in particular doesn't have any extended family whatsoever that live in the state of Kansas. So local friends are our family, and they have come from Bible studies or Sunday school classes. Jason and Becky Clausen, she's winking at everybody here, I guess. Uh, (laughs) Totally her personality. (laughs) Uh, They lead a couple of different groups, and this is what they said. We've been with our life group for about six years now. We've walked through a lot of life circumstances together and have prayed for each other and supported each other through the good and the bad. We encourage each other in our faith journeys and can also discuss openly and honestly the issues that we're struggling with. The benefit to us has been immeasurable. Tilly Ayersman, church groups for me have been a great outlet to talk through what it means to live out our faith during trying circumstances and deep personal struggles. In my experience, it is infinitely viable to have trusted people of faith walking beside you even if they aren't able to walk the road for you. Michelle said, it's a safe place to share our praises and concerns, even the ones that might seem silly or embarrassing in a large group setting. We eat together a lot Bicycle together, have done service projects, traveled to conferences, attended funerals of loved ones, and of course, studied the Bible. Our group, our group has become like extended family to us. Hearing their perspectives on passages or speakers is always interesting and thought-provoking. I love what Kim said here. I started attending Rich Point about seven years ago. I came alone for about a year and jumped into the Bible study right, group right away. This group helped me to feel connected and I was and was a wonderful transition for me. Less than a year later, I attended a life group showcase, for lack of a better description, and joining a life group was a complete game changer. Chris, who's got all the exclamation points. No matter how good or bad my week is gone, connecting with friends and fellow Christians on Sunday morning helps me center my life on what's most important, God. It all starts and ends there. They make my life better. All the exclamation points, right? I like what Taylor said here. We had to use, I think, Tony Stark's head for his Lego character. (laughs) It's incredible how really diving into a group, allowing yourself to share just a little bit, can take you from feeling so alone to seeing and experiencing grace in a real way. Seeing that I share more battles and trials with the person at church pew behind me was a massive catalyst in my faith. Jeff Hawkins said, in our men's ministry, we have several groups to build on our growth and our relationship and understanding of the Holy Trinity. The horizontal, lifelong relationship of brothers lifting each other up in our growth is essential to keep moving closer toward that vertical relationship with God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. I like Richard. That's a great picture of him. Yeah, amazing. A group of men loving one another, old in age, young at heart, encouragement of the scriptures, life's lessons who Christ is today, his promises through the Bible. And the last but not least, Mike Hearn. Groups have always, groups have ways of communicating. There have been many times that when a group text or a group me note is exactly what is needed at that specific time. 
Which brings us back to this base camp. I think for some of us, we would say that we need to add group participation to our kit because we lack it before our hike. And just so you know, we're always putting new groups together. There's plenty of groups that you can join, Sunday schools, Bible studies. So st- stay tuned for those things. You can also meet me at the Connect Tables Day after worship, and I can help you get connected. In fact, we're trying to start another one uh, through the Schaefer family. I asked them, they're already busy, uh, but I said, why would you add leading a life group on top of your already busy life? And this is what they said. One of the best ways to grow your faith is to be in a community with other believers, as is typically done in life groups here at our church. We're excited about leading a new type of group that starts and ends, then mixes up. We hope that it will be a good way for new people and those attending for some time to connect with each other while growing in their relationships with God. And so if you'd like to join their group, they're beginning to assemble that new group. They're going to be at the Connect table after this this service and next service. So I encourage you to strike up a conversation with them. But this is simply something that draws us closer to Christ and it deepens our faith. I think at the base camp we also recognize that there's some stuff that we need to leave behind. Okay? There are things that are not going to be so helpful in the hike ahead. Maybe you and I find ourselves at this base camp for another reason. Not to pick up group life, but for another reason. To leave something behind. Maybe some of us need to leave behind our penchant for divisive talk or perhaps our smug personality or an irritable temper these days. Those things will not be helpful in the hike ahead. So we need to leave it behind. We need to hear once again Paul's twin commands to encourage one another in the faith and to accept one another just as Christ accepted us. Let's pray together this morning. God, we thank you that you're rich in generosity towards us in Christ. We thank you that you've never given up on us. That you're going to finish this work until it's all the way completed. And part of that is to love you and to love our neighbor. God, we confess to you at times. We are so worried about connecting with others because they may fail us or we may fail them. But nevertheless, you tell us to persevere. You tell us to press on to find ourselves in community, that life-giving community where grace can be extended and where growth happens. So God, this day I pray that you would unleash a great movement within this church of connection, of accepting one another. And as we do so, may we witness all of our faith being deepened as we do so. We ask all these things in Jesus' name and all of God's people said together. Amen. Thanks for coming this morning. We enjoyed having you in worship. Go in peace. We'll see you next week. Thanks again so much for joining us today, whether you're watching online or listening to our podcast. If you're watching live or sometime early in the fall of 22, we just recently relaunched all of our fall ministries here at Ridgepoint. So whatever your age or stage of life, we have a group or a class designed just for you. Our kids and student ministries are back up and running on Wednesdays and Sundays, and adults are always welcome to check out any of our ongoing Sunday school classes, life groups, Bible studies, or young adult 2030 groups. Head over to ridgepointwichita.com slash fall for all those details. And if you prefer to engage with us more online, I invite you to dig a little bit deeper wherever you're watching or listening right now. Our sermons are super bingeable, so go ahead and fire up whatever message comes up after this one. Or to be, sh- be sure to subscribe on YouTube and take a look around to see what other content we have available. If there's ever anything else that we can do for you, give us a follow on your favorite social network and send us a direct message. Any of our pastors or ministry leaders would be happy to pray with you or to chat about various ways that you can take a next step in your faith journey. Thanks again for being here today, and we hope to catch you again real soon.